Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The name of the message today is the widow's coin. I'm not using the King James word. We call it the widow's might, the widow's coin. And it's from Mark 12, 38 through 44. Every business has its own terminology and meaning for words. Um, when you fly an airplane, you talk about the attitude of the airplane. And that doesn't mean that your airplane uh, has a positive or negative attitude or is having a good or bad day. Uh, it's a different use of the word. So, uh, you know, if the airplane's climbing, the nose is high above the horizon, it's got an attitude. And, and if it's going straight and level, it's got an attitude. And if the nose is down and you're descending, it's got an attitude. What is the attitude of your plane? Uh, when you learn how to fly, sometimes they put a blindfold on your eyes, so to speak, and, and then they mix, <laughs> they do this. <laughs> And then they leave the plane about like this, and then you get to look through a little crack, and with the instruments you have to straighten it out. Uh, they, they call it unusual attitudes. A plane can have an unusual attitude. Well, people have attitudes too. They affect our upward and downward direction in life as well. And a positive attitude brings you and others up, and a negative attitude brings you and the people around you down, and it's kind of uh, related to aviation in that sense. Whether you go up or down depends on your attitude. Well, today I want to tackle this text. I've been avoiding it, I think, for 40 years, and I've been trying not to avoid anything. I think before I, you know, fall over dead, which could be any day, I know that, uh, uh, I want to try to cover some of these texts that I haven't covered before. And this is the story of the widow's coin found in um, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, beginning verse 38. And we learn a lot from this uh, story about the widow and her coin. There's a lot of important lessons for our life as I meditated on it this week. First of all, uh, kind of maybe fitting for election week and politics, is the corrupt ruling class. The corrupt ruling class, Mark 12, 38 through 40. Mark 12, beginning at verse 38. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They were the ruling class. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces. And they have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for a show. Make, they make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Jesus warns us here to keep alert to the dangers of the corrupt ruling class. He says, watch out for the teachers of the law. The lawyers, <laughs> the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> I was in my little country church, and I first started out, and a farmer came up to me and said, you just stay here the rest of your life. Don't move down to the Twin Cities. He says, you'll have doctors and lawyers in your church, and they'll give you nothing but trouble. <laughs> says, you won't get any trouble from us farmers. The very people who had the job of teaching uh, the Ten Commandments were the very people who violated them in the most horrible ways. Sometimes I tremble at the awesome position I have occupying this pulpit. Uh, thankfully, I've never been in a situation where I've had opportunity to deal with massive amounts of money or power, uh, but still, as I examine my own heart and the sins of my own heart, I shudder sometimes as to whether or not I should really be here in this pulpit at all. I think of James chapter 3, 1 often. Uh, you know, sometimes I go pray at the altar head of the service, and, and my prayer is always, Lord, I shouldn't be here. Why should I be here? I can't. I've got too many faults. Then I say, well, Jesus, <laughs> it's because of you I can do this. 
James 3.1 says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach are to be judged more strictly. James goes on to talk about the tongue. And, you know, that's one of my faults. The tongue. We sang, oh, be careful, little tongue, tongue what you say today in Sunday school. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's not always so much what I say, it's what I neglect to say. That I just don't have the courage to tell someone about my precious Savior. Or that I don't give someone, a family member or someone else, the encouragement they need. Or that I don't express gratitude as I really ought to. Those are probably the biggest sins of my tongue. And uh, Jesus said, notice these three things about the corrupt ruling class. Number one, they wear extravagant clothing. Most people wore simple, crude linen robes in those days, but Jesus said they wore flowing robes, nice, flexible, soft cloth. Must have been made of the finest cloth that could be purchased. Very expensive in those day and age. That day and age. Uh, I can understand why the Amish people wear this, this simple homemade clothes. They get it from right here. They get it right here from the words of Jesus. Don't be extravagant and showing off with your clothes. And then they have an obsession with titles. They have an obsession with titles. Uh, they want special recognition in public and titles, special seats at events, people moving out of their way. Uh, pastor Marty Horn was a pastor, um, you know, down there in Kenyon, Minnesota, Mark Hinderocker's home church, Haugie Lutheran Church. And outside of Kenyon is this giant cathedral in the cornfield, Holden Lutheran Church. It just sticks up out of the fields there, and it's a humongous cathedral. And the pastor there back in, I suppose, the late 1800s was famous. He was one of the founders of St. Olaf College. The Reverend B.J. Moose, M-U-U-S. And he was known for his pompous attitude. <laughs> That's why you had Haugie and Asplund and all these other little churches too, because they didn't want to be a part of Moose's Cathedral. Uh, he, would, he would drive his buggy down the narrow dirt roads out there between Kenyon and Wanamingo, and he was the great pastor of the great cathedral. And if a farmer came down the road with his wagon full of milk cans on his way to the creamery, Pastor Moose expected the farmer to go down in the ditch with his milk cans and risk tipping them over so that he could continue straight on the road without going into the bumpy road on the side. And a hundred years later, the people of that area are still talking about that. Uh, Pastor Moose was kind of a uh, controversial in those days because his wife left, left him and he got remarried. And uh, You can't blame her. <laughs> she was married to a pompous so-and-so. And, but he was the pastor in those days. What a contrast that was to Dr. Dan Lindbergh. He was a, um, a visitation pastor when I was in seminary at Trinity Lutheran Church in Minnehaha Falls. And uh, he had been a missionary in Africa for most of his career highly educated, brilliant man, and he had every right to be pompous, and they said, um, in Africa they had a train car for the rich with soft seats, and then a train car for those who were a little bit poorer, and then they had a cattle car for the poor. And they expected Dr. Lindbergh to ride with the rich, and he always rode in the cattle car with the poor. Because he said, I'm not any better than any of them. And I think in Africa, they're still talking about that, too. My associate pastor, my visitation pastor in Cloquet, uh, Pastor Juntinen, was doctor, the reverend doctor. And he, when we hired him, he said, don't tell anybody that I have my doctorate. These are working class people working in the paper mill and in the lumber mills. He said, that only gets in the way. 
Don't, just, just introduce me as Pastor Wayne. What a contrast. They love their titles. They love their titles. And then conspicuous giving like we did for the children. They would go up to the offering plate in the temple and take their money and parade it up there, the big wads of money and probably gold coins, ding, 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 ding. And they wanted to be seen. They wanted people to know how much they had given. Beware of people who parade these kind of things. Not all rulers are corrupt if you study history, but a high percentage of them are. And uh, they were just that way in Jesus' day. They are today. They're rich, powerful. They like to hold on to power. They like to keep people under their thumb and stay in control. Uh, many of them have never been poor, but some of them have been. Have been. Uh, Stalin in, in Russia and Castro in Cuba, they were very poor. But once they tasted wealth and power, they just became equally corrupt practically overnight and killed millions even of their own citizens. So the second thing we see here um, about the widow's coin is the offerings of the rich and the poor. Mark 12, 41 through 42. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. There were big givers and there were small givers. When it comes to the Lord work, it still is that way. And the temple leadership set up the giving so everybody could make a spectacle and watch the people give. And it ended up being a real humiliation for those who did not have much to give. Uh, my mother said when she was a young girl, uh, in order to motivate giving in the church, the church I grew up in would publish the names of everybody in the church and how much they gave at the end of the year. And some of you here, uh, uh, Carolyn, you're shaking your head. You remember those days. They called them their dues, how many dues they had paid. And, and those who gave uh, loved to have that published, and those who didn't have much were embarrassed. Now, we had a single uh, school teacher who lived with her mother, and she had no expenses, and she was a, a kind and generous person, and she gave a lot. And that got published too, and people would go and chew her out for giving so much because it made them look bad. And she didn't do it for show, it's just the way the system was, and fortunately they quit that. Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, verses 2 through 4, a little more detail. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. There's no reward in heaven for that kind of giving. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Everybody in the temple was watching this poor widow as she go, came in and put in her two little copper coins. And it appears to be there, there must have been some kind of a reaction, maybe some snickering that went on. Uh, so that res needed a response. But she was a widow. And, and of course, many widows, some widows have it pretty good, but many, uh, depending on the situation, how, when, and where their husbands died, um, don't have very much. It used to be much worse. Uh, when I was about 13 years old, I had a paper out in our small town where we lived, and I had a number of widows who took the daily newspaper that I delivered, the La Crosse Tribune, and I, um, I distinctly remember, you know, I, I think it was uh, $1.25 a week to get the La Crosse Tribune, if I remember correctly, and I'd have to go around house to house in the evenings collecting uh, for the newspaper, and I'd get to these widows and knock on their door, and, and I remember, I remember just clearly, they'd, they'd come with their little coin purse, which may or may not even have a dollar bill in it. And to get that dollar 25, I can remember them laying it out on the table, dimes and nickels, maybe a quarter or two. 
until they had enough money uh, to pay for that paper. You see, most, many of them did not have any television set. They might have had a radio, an old tube type radio, and uh, they, were, they lived in rooming houses, these widows, the poor ones, above the stores, above the businesses. I had to climb those steps up to their little teeny poor apartments or in rooming houses. And uh, the newspaper was their only connection with the world. And so it was so important to them. And you know, as poor as they were, and as much as they had to take their little coin purse to measure out their nickels and dimes to pay me every week, they would often have a cookie for me, a fresh baked cookie. And that was no small, small sacrifice for them to bake cookies for the paper boy. Uh, I suspect their church giving probably was $10 a year if that and it was embarrassing, and that was more than they could afford. I also remember some of the wealthier people in my hometown. I remember them. And, and they would parade into church, usually at the last minute, and they would sit up front, and they would have the latest clothes on. Of course, back then in the early 1970s, that would be, uh, for the men, plaid pants, in big wide ties, or a pastel leisure shirt with leisure suit with a flowered shirt. Can you imagine that? Parading up and parading in and sitting down and and showing showing everybody who they were and that they were in church. Times haven't changed. Hearts are still the same. That's how different people give. And then finally. Um, the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter. Mark 12, verses 43 through 44. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Jesus wanted his disciples, who would eventually be laying the foundation for his church over all the world, to learn this lesson, to learn this lesson, a lesson which the church forgot quite quickly. He wanted them to realize that the destitute widow gave more than the rich. She gave all she had to live on, even though it was so little. And God is happier about the spirit of giving than the amount of giving. God is happier about the spirit of giving than the amount of giving. Sometimes people ask me about giving. Should I give a tithe? 10% of my income, as the Old Testament talks about, the tithe. And I say, well, that's, it, it could be a good a guide if that's what you feel is a good guide and feel good about that. But I tell them there is a New Testament standard for giving, and it's found in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, where um, the Apostle Paul says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generous, generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Give what you can give cheerfully. Give what you can give cheerfully. Uh, Pastor Trig Vidali, though, he didn't have much, and he laid down $1,000 for starting our Free Lutheran Bible College, and he said, give till it hurts, give more until it stops hurting, and then give a little bit more till it feels good. <laughs> that was Trig Vidali's interpretation. This widow gave sacrificially and I believe cheerfully to the work of the Lord. In her heavenly home, she reaps a great reward 
because she did not so sparingly. She gave what she could. This does not merely apply to church giving. It applies to all giving, whether it's food for the poor or a listening ear to someone who has a burden on their heart or a helping hand to someone who is overwhelmed by life. Now, <laughs> here's where an opportunity comes to give. Here it is. Avenil Carlson is dying. Her daughter's been care caring for her. She had to go home to New Jersey to her family this week for 10 days to get everything ready, and then she's going to come back indefinitely until her mother's gone and until the estate is liquidated. But there's 10 days where Gary is home alone with Avenil. No. Twice a day for a period of several hours, there's a hospice nurse. But there are two-hour blocks of time here and there where uh, it's only Gary, and he's getting feeble. She needs to take her pain medication. And Gary is too soft-hearted. If she doesn't feel like it, he goes, she doesn't want to take it. And the daughter says, Mom, take this now. And she does. And she wants to get up, and she can't, because if she gets up, she'll fall and be hurt, and it'll be terrible. And Gary's so soft. Well, can't we let her get? No. <laughs> you can't do that. So they need someone to be there for two-hour blocks of time. Their church, Bethel's Rock, is trying to cover this, but they don't know if they can cover all those two-hour blocks. And we've gotten to know Gary and Avenil, and if you are willing to do a two-hour block in the next 10 days and sit with Gary at their house. She might even be passed away today. We just don't know. Let me know after the service, okay? And I think you'll find it to be a great blessing as well. Now, there's just a practical opportunity to give to a couple who gave their whole life, their whole life, to serve the Lord sacrificially in South Africa and Jamaica. Now, I know they have a beautiful home, and I think they inherited some money to get that because they wouldn't have got that as missionaries. But they need us now. Uh, perhaps a young mother might need someone to step in and watch her children so she can get some sleep. Perhaps a lonely widow might really need a visit. Uh, I can give you some names of some widows who would love to have a visit. I have names. But the main thing God is looking for is to give with a willing heart. And that's the way Jesus gave himself on the cross. Uh, there's an amazing verse in Hebrews chapter 12 where it says, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. The joy of going to the cross. He knew that by going to the cross and paying for our sins with his holy and precious blood and opening up the door of heaven for all who will look to him and believe that there would be joy. So he willingly left heaven's glory and gave himself on the painful cross where the worst pain was taking the sins of the world. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men and you will not grow weary and lose heart. So these are some of the lessons we learn from the widow who dropped her last coin into the temple offering almost 2,000 years ago. That, that private little offering is still being talked about and an example for us all today in how we should be joyful givers in every way. Amen. Now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.